Well, I'm certain that if Albert Einstein were alive today, there would not be a one of us that would stand face to face with Albert Einstein and say, I challenge you to a physics debate. Or, I'm, I'm fairly certain there's not a one of us in here this morning that would walk up to a special forces sniper and say, hey, how about a duel? And when he was in his prime, I'm certain, and still not even today, uh, maybe a few of you might be uh, brash enough to do that, but I wouldn't ever have thought about walking up to Michael Jordan and saying, let's do a little one-on-one. Those seem like pretty silly scenarios, don't they? And yet, 2,000 years ago, a religious lawyer walked up to the Son of God, looked Him in the eye, and challenged Him. It's pretty amazing. He had the audacity to stand face to face with the Son of God and tempt Him in spiritual matters. He who spoke all things into existence. He who kept all things by the power of His hand. He who was fully God and fully man was being spiritually tempted and challenged by a sinful human being. And yet from this, we are privileged to receive the account of this, what we find in Luke chapter 10. It's commonly known as the parable of the Good Samaritan. And I'd like us to examine the parable of the Good Samaritan under seven quick headings this morning. The first one is an important question. The lawyer, in verse number 25, stood up and tempted Jesus and said, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now I would like us to forget for just a moment who was asking the question. And I'd like us to forget for just a moment the manner in which he was asking the question. And what I want us to do is focus in on the actual question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? How do I get eternal life? What must I do to be saved? Is there a more important question that we need answered in this life? No, there is not. You see, God has put within all of us this morning the longing for spiritual things, the desire for eternal life. This is why so many sought the fountain of youth. The writings of the fountain of youth go all the way back to uh, Herodotus, 5th century B.C., It's been a very long time. And for thousands and thousands of years, there has been a longing. Ever since man has been created, there's been a longing in the heart for eternal life. If you don't believe me, just think about all the hospitals and doctors and and why we actually go to the doctor and why we go to hospitals. Because we are seeking to prolong life for as long as we can. We're seeking to avoid death. My friends, the most important question you can ask today is how can I receive eternal life? What must I do to be saved? It's an important question. And then verse 25, we see a tempting heart. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him. Tempted Jesus. Sadly, the intentions of this lawyer were way off base. His intention in asking this important question, was not to receive an answer from the Lord of glory, but rather his intention was to tempt Jesus. And that word tempted in verse 25 comes from the Greek word ek perazo, which means to thoroughly test. Again, I go back to my opening illustration. Would we dare stand before Albert Einstein and thoroughly test him in physics? Would we dare stand before Supreme Court judges such as Samuel Alito or John Roberts and challenge them to a debate on constitutional law? How arrogant we would be to think we could do that. And yet, here stood this lawyer thoroughly testing the eternal Son of God, trying to trip Him up. Can you see the damaging effects that sin has not only on our physical bodies, but on our physical brains as well, on our minds. 
Sin is not to be messed around with. We must not trifle with sin. It will destroy us without the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. We would all be this arrogant as this lawyer who tempted the Son of God. We see an important question. We see a tempting heart. But thirdly, we see a curious answer. Jesus said in verse 26 unto the lawyer, what is written in the law? How do you read the law? You see, a lawyer was one who read the law. I think they, um, they, they say it even over in Europe today, when you go to uh, college and when you go to the university, you go to read the law. You go to read certain of the subjects that you're studying. And that's what this lawyer did. He read the law. And Jesus said, how is it you, that you read the law? And the lawyer answered Jesus and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. He did well at reading the law. He had a great answer for Jesus. But here comes the curious answer of Jesus. When he looked at the lawyer and said unto him, You've answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. Now at first glance... As believers who are justified by faith without works, we might be a little thrown off by the answer of Jesus here. Right? It almost sounds like Jesus was telling the lawyer that if he obeyed the greatest of commandments and loved the Lord as God with all his heart, soul, strength, and mind, and loved his neighbor as himself, he could receive eternal life. He could inherit eternal life. What's going on here? Do the words of Jesus make us a little uncomfortable? Well, Jesus' answer to the lawyer may seem a little curious to us at first glance, but is rather a very meticulous answer. Because this lawyer came to thoroughly test Jesus and to tempt Him, as we see in verse 25, but the Son of God will not stand in question to the court of man. And Jesus looks at this lawyer in the eye and essentially says, you're a student of the law, what does the law say? And when the lawyer answers with the great commandment, Jesus says, all right. You have your answer. Go. Obey the greatest of commandments and live. What was Jesus saying here, church? That eternal life can be inherited? Surely there must be some mistake. But this isn't the first place in Scripture we see this. The principle of obedience to God as a necessity to eternal life is found in the covenant between God and the very first man, Adam. What did God tell Adam in the Garden of Eden? If you obey me, you live. By inference, we understand if he disobeyed him, he would what? Die. And Adam disobeyed God and ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And had he not done that, he would not have died. In other words, he would have lived in a perfect state for eternity. And that eternal life is what his question is all about, isn't it? Now, if you think I'm not sounding like a very good Protestant this morning, I want you to stick with me. You need to hang in here with me. Hear me out is what the Word of God says. The Bible teaches after Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden that he spiritually died. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world... And death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Because Adam sinned, all of us have sinned. This is what we call original sin. It means that in Adam, all of his posterity spiritually dies. So once Adam passes his seed down to his children, they are born as sinners. They are born spiritually dead. And when they pass their seed down to their children, and their children do to their children, and so on and so forth, we have a real problem. The real problem is this. Everyone born into the world is a sinner separated from God Almighty. But you might say, and some might say, Pastor, I'm a good person. Well, if that's our answer to this this morning, then we're right in line with this lawyer who's 
thoroughly trying to test Jesus. His whole thinking was way off base. And Jesus was using the law to get his thinking back on track. Jesus said, you think you can inherit eternal life? Go for it. Keep the law and you will receive eternal life. The only problem is you must keep the law perfectly. Without ever messing up one time. Jesus says, all right. Give it your best shot. James chapter 2 and verse 10 says, For whosoever, I want you to listen closely to the word of God, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. You can keep the whole law of God, break it in one point, and you're guilty of breaking every last law of God. Want to give it a shot? Want to inherit eternal life? Galatians 3, verse 10, listen to this. Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things. Think we can do that? I don't think so. You see, Jesus' answer wasn't so curious after all. The lawyer was trying to trick Jesus by making Jesus think that, oh, this is a good person. He's good enough to earn eternal life. Jesus doesn't fall for his trick. Jesus says, go for it. Go for it. Do it. But if you're going to do it, you must do it perfectly. There cannot be one blemish on your record. Well now, that changes everything. And that's exactly what Jesus set out to do in this lawyer's life. Change everything about the way he was thinking. And so we see an important question, a tempting heart, and a curious answer. And we come now to the fourth thing that we see in verse 28. And that's a peculiar predicament. He said unto him, Jesus said to the Lord, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. Now those words of Jesus right there, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. Those words should have sent shivers up and down that lawyer's spine. You know it? Why? Because the lawyer should have known his own heart. (laughs) The lawyer did know his own heart. The lawyer knew that he hadn't always loved God with all his heart. The lawyer knew he hadn't always loved his neighbor as himself. The lawyer knew he had broken the law, he had broken the law of God time and time and time again. And Jesus knew the lawyer's heart. And that's why he was pointing the lawyer to examine his own heart because outside of Jesus, no one knows our hearts better than we do. And so when Jesus told this lawyer, go ahead, keep the greatest commandment and live, the lawyer should have had terror strike his heart because he should have known he can't do that. You cannot inherit eternal life, my friends, for the very fact that you and I are sinners. And you can't stand before God at judgment day and say, accept me, receive me, just as I am. Sinner! God cannot let you into His presence with sin on your account. You've not kept the law of God perfectly. You've broken the law at some point in your life and therefore you're guilty of breaking all the law, as James 2.10 says. Who among us can say we've always loved the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, and with all our mind? Who among us this morning can say we have always loved our neighbor as ourselves? Not a one of us. If we're intellectually honest, not a one of us. And this is precisely why we need Jesus. And this is what Jesus was trying to get this lawyer to see and understand. Should not the lawyer have cried out to Jesus? This is impossible. You say, go ahead and do it, but I can't do it. That's exactly what he should have cried out. 
The thought of keeping God's law perfectly should have so overwhelmed this lawyer that he should have fallen down to his knees and cried out, Have mercy upon me, O son of David! He should have been convicted to the very core of his being. He should have been discouraged and despaired so greatly of his own merit. He should have been so overwhelmed to not move another muscle without asking Jesus for mercy. You see, church, the Bible teaches that Jesus drives us to the law of God in order then that we might be driven to Christ. See, what does that mean? Well, the Bible teaches in Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. What does that mean? The law was our schoolmaster. It means this. Once the law teaches us that we are sinners, and that's exactly what the law should teach us, that we are sinners, that's what it's there to do. We are then driven to the only one who never sinned in order for Him to cover us with His righteousness. Jesus Christ. And we come to Him by by faith, understanding we cannot save ourselves, understanding we can't keep the law of God perfectly. We need Jesus, and we come to Him by faith because of what He has done for us. This is the Gospel, my dear friends. We cannot be justified by the works of the law. When you see that, you're faced with a peculiar predicament. You either bow down at Jesus' feet and call Him Lord, or you go the way of this lawyer. How did the lawyer go? Well, we see an important question, a tempting heart, a curious answer, a peculiar predicament. And then we see a self-righteous attitude. He went the wrong way. Verse 29, But the lawyer, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Even after knowing what he knew about his own heart, the lawyer still tried to justify himself before Jesus. My friends, this just won't work. Instead of humbling himself, he tried to justify himself. That was his only desire. He wasn't seeking to be saved from his own filthy deeds. He wanted his own filthy deeds to save himself. And so in trying to justify himself, he said to Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Almost in a haughty, demeaning manner, he said, Okay, Jesus, I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself. Who is my neighbor? Go ahead and tell me. If you know so much. Well, that was his self righteous attitude, and immediately Jesus had an answer. And that answer was through a convicting parable. That's our sixth point this morning. And we read that parable earlier as we read the text. Jesus had an immediate answer for this lawyer in the form of the parable of the Good Samaritan. I don't see how he did it, other than the fact that he was the Son of God in the flesh. Because I'm often, you know, when I'm talking to somebody and I can't think that quickly on my feet. I'm not that clear in my thinking where, who's my neighbor? And all of a sudden, I can imagine myself just pouring out this parable, this six verse parable. It just proves that Jesus was the Son of God to me, one of the many proofs in Scripture. But the lawyer was still trying to muddy God's law because he knew he was guilty of breaking God's law. But he didn't want Jesus to know that. See, he didn't really believe Jesus was the Son of God. He didn't really believe Jesus already knew his heart. He wanted Jesus to think what everyone else thought about this lawyer. Oh, what a godly man who loves God and who loves his neighbor. What a great person this lawyer is. You see, that's what happens when we try to justify ourselves. That's all we really care about. What's, what, what do they think of me? What's everyone else think of me? Not what does God think of me. Not what I know to be true of my own heart, but what does everyone else think of me? This lawyer, whatever it took, he, he didn't want Jesus to know. He didn't want anyone else to know how badly he had failed and how wicked he truly was. But you see, the wonderful thing about Jesus, he had no problem pointing out this lawyer's sin. Because the lawyer was the priest and the Levite in the parable who saw the Jew, there on the ground, beaten to a bloody pulp, walked right on past. Stopped, took a little peek, and kept on walking. 
the priest and the Levite. Those were the religious people of the day. If anyone should have stopped, you would have thought it had been the priest and the Levite. But that's who the lawyer was. The very one who should have been loving this beaten Jew was the very one passing over him and not doing what? Not loving his neighbor as himself. Jesus was, I mean, he had this lawyer dead to rights. It's okay, smarty pants. Maybe he didn't say that, but he might have been thinking it. I don't know. You're so smart. You're so good at keeping the law. Let me tell you a little story. And do you know who you are in this story? You're the one who walked right past the neighbor. I'm not even going to bring up the first part of the great commandment Jesus must have been thinking. Because how can you love God with all your heart if you can't even love your neighbor as yourself? He was dead to rights. No chance. No chance. I wonder what this lawyer must have been thinking at this point. He should have been thinking, guilty. All it took was one little parable to show this man that he needed to stop justifying himself. Because he was a wretched sinner who needed Jesus. And this takes us to our conclusion this morning. We've seen an important question. We've seen a tempting heart. We've seen a curious answer. We've seen a peculiar predicament. We've seen a self-righteous attitude. We've seen a convicting parable. And then finally, we see the true Good Samaritan in verses 36 and 37. When Jesus got done with His parable, He looked at the lawyer and said, okay, out of these three... There were the priest and the Levite, and then there was the Samaritan. The Samaritan who were supposed to be enemies to the Jews, he's the one who stopped, bound up his wounds, poured oil and wine on his wounds, put him on his beast, took him to an inn, gave the innkeeper his money, and said, if you put any more money against, to this man's account, I will pay for it when I return. Who was that good Samaritan? Well... He was pointing us to the true Good Samaritan. Because Jesus said, Which of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And the lawyer said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. You see, Jesus is the one who came to be the Savior. Jesus is the one who would show mercy on His people. And so ultimately what Jesus was saying to this lawyer, He was He still had him dead to rights because he was saying, okay, if the Good Samaritan was the one who showed mercy, go and do likewise. In other words, Jesus was telling the lawyer, can you live up to my standards? Can you live up to the standards of the law of God? If you can, this do and live. Can you do it? Well, as we've seen already, if you try to do it, and inherit eternal life, you will only deceive and frustrate yourself because you know you're guilty. Instead, I implore you here this morning, stop trusting yourself if you are trusting your own works righteousness for salvation. It won't get you to eternal life. you, You cannot inherit eternal life through works righteousness. Stop that. Trust the one who has done it for us. Trust the true good Samaritan who has done it in our place. The one who's already taken care of everything in our stead. The one who came to us and picked us up and bound our wounds. Who carried us to the Father and said, this is mine, Father. He is mine. She is mine. Everything he or she has ever done, put it on my account. And on the cross of Calvary, Jesus bore our sins in His body on that tree. All of our sins was taken on the account of Jesus for us. He's the true good Samaritan. Why would you try? Why would you try to live up to that? You can't. I can't. The lawyer couldn't. Jesus has paid it all for us. Trust His life. Trust His death. Trust His resurrection. And then, when we trust Him who has done it all for us, 
It's a funny thing that happens. Jesus drives us to the law to show us our guilt. The law drives us back to Christ to show us that He's the only one that Jesus can, is the only one that can forgive us. But then when we become born again, something changes in our lives to where now all of a sudden we're not trying to keep the law to be saved. We're trying to keep the law because we are saved. We desire to keep the law of God. It's all of a sudden the desire of our heart. That's what the Good Samaritan was doing. He wasn't helping this Jew to be a Christian. He was helping the Jew because he was a Christian. The law drives us to Christ. Rather, Christ drives us to the law and the law drives us back to Christ. Do you understand that this morning, church? It's a great principle in the Word of God. He is the true Samaritan. Look to Jesus this morning. Let's pray. Father, I thank You so much for Your grace, for Your mercy, for Jesus, the true good Samaritan. Lord, if our hearts sometimes deceive ourselves, and indeed our hearts do deceive us, and we begin to creep into a works righteousness just like this lawyer did, forgive us, God. And help us to understand the law is not there to inherit eternal life. That's already been done for us in our place by Jesus Christ. By His life, by His death, by His burial, by His resurrection, by His ascension. But the law is there to drive us to Christ, to show us our guilt and drive us to Christ. So that then, as Christians, we desire to obey God's law. May it be the desire of our hearts to love the Lord our God with all of our being and to love our neighbors as ourselves this morning. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's respond.